Okay, so we're going to look at problems like this one, where you're given the greatest common divisor, also known as the highest common factor, of two integers, and you're also given the lowest common multiple of two integers. And in particular, we're interested in how many solutions there are to this sort of problem. So we'll start by looking at this, just for this specific example with 2 and 90, then we'll build up to the more general case. And we're only going to be interested in positive integer solutions, but if you are keen, you can have a go at extending this method to include negative integers for x and y as well. So there's a really key insight into this problem that's going to make things much more easy for us. So there's the following result, that if you have two integers, if you multiply together the greatest common divisor and the lowest common multiple of x and y, you get the product x times y. So just to see why this would be the case informally, we can think of this in terms of our prime factors of x and y. So if we were to put all of our prime factors of x and y into a Venn diagram, the greatest common divisor is what you'd get in the middle, all of the prime factors that are in common with x and y, and you multiply all of those together. Whereas for the lowest common multiple, what you would need to do is multiply together all of the ones in the middle just once to make up the lowest common multiple. You multiply together all of the ones that just belong to x, and we need to include all of the ones that just belong to y, but the ones in the middle we only need to use once when we multiply this together. So then you can see just pictorially that then this is going to be the same as what you get as if you have x, or all the prime factors that belong to x, multiplied by all of the prime factors that belong to y. So the ones in the middle there get counted twice in both scenarios, the ones on the outside only get counted once. So I'll include a more formal proof for this in the description. This is going to be a really useful result throughout, because now you can see for this first example, because the product of the greatest common divisor and lowest common multiple has to be 2 times 90, this is also equal to x times y. So we're limited to only a few cases now, because it has to be equal to 180, and 2 times 90. So at this point, you could just list all of the positive integer factor pairs of 180, but this could get quite long, especially if we had a bigger number there in space of 180. So we can think about this a bit more carefully in terms of the prime factorization of 180. So this is 2 squared times 3 squared times 5. So this will be particularly useful now. The structure that we'll follow here is essentially we're thinking of two integers which you multiply together to get 180. So what we need to do is dish out all of these 2s, 3s and this 5 between x and y so that the product is 180. And don't forget, we need the greatest common divisor to be 2. So this tells us immediately then that a common factor, a common divisor of both of them, is 2. So we already know what to do with our 2s, as a 2 goes into x and a 2 goes into y. So now we need to think about our 3s and this 5. So thinking first about the 3s, if you were to give a 3 to x and a 3 to y, you can then see that the greatest common divisor would actually be 6, or maybe even bigger than that. So it's no good to give these 3s 1 to x and 1 to y, and this would also reduce the lowest common multiple you could check there if you were to give a 3 to x and a 3 to y. So the only option here is you need to give both of these 3s to x, or you need to give both of them to y. And then with the 5, you either give that to x or give that to y. That won't cause us any issues. So here, one option is we could do x is 2 times 3 squared, then perhaps we give the 5 to y. And another way of doing this is we could have x is 2 times 3 squared, and we also multiply this by the 5, then y would just be left equal to 2. So at this point we could actually stop, because we've covered all the possibilities. The only thing is we could also have x and y the opposite way around. So here we could have x is 2 times 5, and y is 2 times 3 squared, and similarly here we could have x is 2, and y is 2 times 3 squared times 5. So it seems we've got four solutions to this problem, just looking for positive integer solutions, or in fact only two solutions if you don't care about the order in which x and y appear. So for our more general problem, where the greatest common divisor is some integer a and the lowest common multiple is some integer b, let's just start by expressing a and b in terms of their prime factorizations. So we can say that a is going to be some prime p1 to some power m1, and so on, up to some prime pk to the power of mk. And it's going to be convenient here to match up, use the same set of primes in our factorizations of a and b. So we'll write b as p1 now to the power of n1, and so on, up to pk to the power of nk. So of course the issue here is that a and b don't necessarily need to have 
the exact same list of prime factors. So there could be a prime factor which B has, which A doesn't have. But we can get around this just by taking one of our powers to be zero in that scenario. So this is fine, and it just gives us a nice convenient way of working with A and B. So this is particularly useful. Remember that x times y has got to be equal to the greatest common divisor times the lowest common multiple. So we know that x, y has got to be equal to a, b, which is then really easy to express with our prime factors as p1 to the m1 plus n1 multiplied by all of the other prime factors up to pk to the power of mk plus nk. So then just like before, we know that the greatest common divisor is a, which means that a is a common factor, a common divisor of both x and y. So we know that x and y both need to contain p1 to the m1 all the way up to pk to the mk, and then potentially multiplied by some other prime factors. And similarly, y needs to have p1 to the m1 all the way up to pk to the mk as part of its prime factorization in order for a to be a divisor of both x and y then it becomes a matter of how do we share out the remaining prime factors so that the greatest common divisor is still a and the lowest common multiple is still b and we need the product x times y to be equal to the product of a and b. So what do we need to actually share out now? Well it becomes a matter of sharing out the remaining prime factors once we've already shared out all of these. So we need x times y to have p1 to the power of m1 plus n1 and we've already shared out two lots of p to the m1. So all that's left now is p1 to the n1 minus m1. So here we have m1 plus n1, then we take away two lots of m1. So you might think because we're subtracting the powers we might end up with problems here, but actually our n1 is always going to be greater than or equal to our m1, and similarly all of our ni's are going to be greater than or equal to our mi's. This is just a consequence of the fact that the greatest common divisor a this is a divisor or a factor of x and y, which are themselves a divisor or a factor of our lowest common multiple b. So this tells us then that a has to be a divisor or a factor of b. So that tells you that all of your m powers are less than or equal to all of your values of n there. So when we share this out, we get this many p1s, and similarly we get p2 to the power of n2 minus m2, and so on. We need to share all the way up to pk, to the nk minus mk. So it seems like we'll get two solutions where we can give all of our p1s to x or all of our p1s to y. Remember that if we were to share some to x and some of them to y, then this would actually increase the greatest common divisor or lower our lowest common multiple, which would be a problem and then our values of x and y would no longer be a solution to the original problem. So there's only two ways of dealing with our p1s. You either give all of them to x or all of them to y. And similarly for our p2s, it seems like we need to either give all of them to x or all of them to y, which gives us another two solutions at so two times two and so on, all the way up to our pks where we have two solutions here. You either give them all to x or give them all to y. So it seems like the answer should be two to the power of k, but actually this doesn't quite work because it is possible that our ni and our mi values are equal to each other for some of these primes in which case there wouldn't be anything to share out. So actually this value 2 to the power of k would be an overestimate for the number of solutions to our original problem. So we'll need to think about this just a little bit more carefully to hone this and get our final solution which is 100% accurate. So now we need a way of capturing how many prime factors there are where its power of n is strictly greater than its corresponding power of m so that there is something left to share out. Then we'll include that in our calculations when we're working out how many solutions x and y there are. And if we look at the prime factorization here with n1 minus m1, n2 minus m2, this is essentially just the prime factorization of b divided by a. So then we can use something called the prime omega function of b over a. So this just counts the number of distinct prime factors of a given integer. So here we've got the number of distinct prime factors of b over a. So then this is really useful, this is telling us how many of these pi's there are where we need to share them out. And then for each of these prime factors that we need to share out, we have two choices. You either give all of them to x or give all of them to y. So our total number of solutions then is just going to be 2 to the power 
of this omega function of b over a. So that was our total solution where we would include repeats as well, so x and y versus y and x, the opposite way round. So if you don't want to include repeats like this, so for example 2 and 4, if you want to count that as being the same as 4 and 2, we could just divide all of this by 2, or we could say this is equal to 2 to the omega b over a minus 1, just reduce the power of 2 by 1 if we're not including repeats. So here the only issue with dividing by 2 is that what if we had a solution where x and y were actually equal to each other? We wouldn't necessarily want to divide by 2 there. Well, it turns out that if x and y being equal to each other is a solution, this is only possible and the greatest common divisor of x and y and the lowest common multiple of x and y would both just be equal to x. So this would be a degenerate case where x equals y equals a and equals b. So we don't care too much about that example. So in general, as long as a and b are distinct from each other, we can have divide this by 2 to avoid having repeats. So the total number of solutions then is 2 to the power of the number of distinct prime factors of b over a, or we just halve this if we don't want to include repeats. So now this prime omega function, it turns out there isn't a particularly nice way to express this algebraically, so we'll just leave it in this form as our neatest possible final solution there.